Thank you, Arthur, for this very kind introduction. Uh, I must say that after such an introduction, there is even bigger pressure now on me. Um, and uh, thank you for, for giving me this opportunity to um, present present today uh, the last 10 years of uh, rock art research in Dakhla. I must confess that uh, when preparing this lecture um, and this, this, this presentation, um, I was struggling a bit because I wasn't, I wasn't really sure um, uh, of the formula in which uh, this lecture should be um, presented. Um, I didn't know whether I should really focus on, on rock art itself or maybe it's better to uh, to, to um, uh, present uh, the particular topics that were studied by the uh, by the Dachlois project uh, uh, recently, and I, I I've chosen the latter. Um, but of course, presenting all those topics means that um, I can't really go into into details. So so I consider this um, lecture. To be sort of a um, guide, a guidebook to to rock art research in Dakhla, and basically anyone who um, would be interested in more detailed um, account uh, will find in this very presentation here and there uh, references to various uh, major contributions uh, of our expedition. Um, I don't know if this formula works well, but well, we'll see. Um, We'll see. Okay, I'm starting the presentation. It doesn't work. <laughs> okay. Um, a couple of words to, to make a background, uh, um, because I, I assume that not everyone is familiar with uh, the uh, archaeology of the Western Desert of Egypt and uh, with the Dakhla Oasis project in particular. So um, Dakhla Oasis project is um, sort of an umbrella project uh, that brings together various independent expeditions working on different aspects of, uh, especially archaeology, but not only of the oasis in the Western Desert. And our mission, the DOP Petroglyph Unit, is just one of such independent uh, missions uh, with the sole purpose of working with rock art. Um, but uh, all these missions, um, well, are, are quite connected with each other. Um, uh, there is a lot of uh, exchange of information, exchange of uh, uh, skills and expertise, a lot of help uh, involved. Uh, and, and, and all the missions under the Dachloes project uh, umbrella uh, share, I would say, certain ethics and certain uh, big goals um, with each other. And of course, uh, the DOP uh, is not just um, an abstract uh, entity uh, only on paper, but it's uh, embodied in a way uh, in our headquarters, um, a, a compound built in, in Dakhla, where all the missions, uh, when um, doing field work, uh, doing research, can stay, can, uh, can work, uh, can relax, and so on. And uh, I would like to also mention the very important um, aspect of the DOP's activity, uh, uh, which is uh, publishing uh, the results. Um, the DOP has its own monograph series that is published by Oxford Books from Oxford. And uh, across the years, um, a really an extensive uh, catalog of publications uh, have been, has been published. Um, my own involvement in, in uh, the DOP uh, dates back to uh, 2011 when I was for the first time in, in the Oasis. And from that time, uh, I'm still in the team. And actually from 2016, um, I took over uh, the directorship of the Petroglyph unit. And I was able to, uh, to obtain uh, three different uh, grants from the Polish National Science Center that basically uh, were the core financing of the, uh, of the project. Um, well, that is the, let's say, logistic uh, background of, of the research. Um, the Oasis itself 
is the biggest oasis in Egypt. And it's located roughly halfway between the Nile Valley and the modern um, Libyan Egyptian um, border uh, to the west. It's a little bit closer to the valley than, than to the border, but still it's in the heart of the Western desert. So uh, it's a very isolated place even nowadays and especially in antiquity and in prehistory. Um, place which always was a, um, sort of unique, uh, culturally unique and um, not easily reachable uh, from the Nile Valley. Um, it's, uh, it's a very long oasis, it's uh, about 90 kilometers long. Um, that is, uh, um, which is located just beneath the huge uh, escarpment of the Libyan plateau. It's a limestone plateau overlooking the entire oasis and uh, being basically the, 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 the most recognizable landmark in the area. Um, and of course, most of the habitation, uh, most of the settlements, most of the cultivation, farms and so on are located in this green area where uh, water was always um, available more easily than elsewhere, especially in antiquity and in prehistory. Today, the, the um, water table of this underground water is um, it considerably dropped. So, so it's not so easy to, um, to, to, to get this water out, but, uh, but it's of course still possible and that's why the, the oasis is still inhabited. This is how it looks like uh, from the perspective of the oasis floor. So we have in the, in the background, the escarpment of the Libyan plateau uh, with this Piedmont area, all these uh, sediments that slide down from the top of the escarpment. Then we have desert and, and uh, moving uh, sand dunes and the area of the cultivation. But most of the archaeology, or at least a lot of archaeology in Dakhla is conducted, uh, archaeological research is conducted in areas uh, that are, um, well, simply desert. Um, and uh, this is the case, of course, of rock art research, which obviously um, takes place in, in, in areas where, where rock, rocks are available. Sandstone rocks, uh, should add, and uh, the sandstone rocks are not, uh, mm, not present in, in everywhere in the oasis, only in certain parts where the sandstone is exposed. Uh, but still, these are uh, extremely large um, territories, uh, far from being surveyed, uh, fully surveyed. Uh, so, so there's definitely a lot of work to be done in the future. Um, Contrary to the interior of the Western Desert, um, the oasis, um, we can say were continuously inhabited uh, since for, for more or less 10,000 years. You can see in this chart, which I took from a very influential uh, paper by um, Rudolf Cooper and, and Stefan Krippelin, um, who modeled a certain processes uh, of climate change in this area. You can see that uh, in what is today the interior, interior of the Western Desert in Egypt and Sudan uh, underwent various uh, climatic changes and the peak of occupation coincided with, uh, with the more uh, favorable uh, climate regime. Uh, and sometime after 5000 BC, uh, depending on the latitude, um, the, the process, process of desertification started again and they, they it simply um, uh, take place all the time. Um, but these climate changes did not affect so much uh, occupation in the oasis, which were uh, more or less continuously occupied by permanent or semi-permanent uh, uh, set, um, settlers, um, and 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 we have um, I mean, archaeologists distinguish uh, various cultural prehistoric cultural units uh, such as epipolitic Masara culture, 
um, Bashendi uh, up to the late Neolithic uh, her cattle herders of Sheikh Muftar, um, inhabiting Dakhla, uh, and the Sheikh Muftar coinciding at certain point with uh, colonizers from the Nile Valley sometime in the middle of the third millennium BC, perhaps during the third or fourth dynasty, uh, um, uh, Egyptians from the Nile Valley reached Dakhla and, and, and slowly, gradually colonized it. And, and basically um, uh, made out of, from, from Dakhla the westernmost, the westernmost outpost of, of, their, of their kingdom. So gradually, with time, Dakhla uh, became uh, more and more connected with this world of the Nile Valley, but also with other oases. And um, of course, archaeologists find uh, a lot of evidence for, for, uh, for various routes um, linking Dakhla with other destinations. And truth is that many of these ancient routes uh, were used in modern times uh, uh, to create uh, new asphalt roads uh, connecting Dakhla with, with the outside world. Um, what is the implication uh, of this nearly continuous um, habitation in Dakhla, the implication for rock art studies? Well, th there are different implications, important ones. Uh, first of all, we are not dealing with one rock art tradition that would last for eight or 10,000 years, but on the contrary, we are dealing with different uh, traditions uh, that uh, can be connected to various periods, to various cultural units. And of course, uh, especially in, 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 in the case of prehistoric rock art, uh, there is a lot of hypothesizing here because we don't have uh, too much hard evidence uh, that would enable us um, dating uh, uh, images uh, directly, let's say. Um, <clears throat> Another implication is that if we find um, petroglyph or petroglyphs that are, that are not immediately recognizable uh, and not easily, uh, uh, that they cannot be ascribed easily to, to, to any of these um, uh, particular traditions, then we have uh, a lot of alternatives. Uh, um, basically, 10,000 of years uh, of, of different cultures, different peoples, different traditions to which we can, uh, of which we can think when, 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 when dating petroglyphs. So we're dealing with a huge palimpsest in which uh, um, it's very difficult to, to connect these puzzles. Um, for instance, in Dakhla, we often find all the objects like pottery, like lithics, like uh, structures, uh, stone structures, close to um, various rock art finds. But it's very risky to connect this spice, I mean, to, to understand the spatial relationships in terms of uh, chronology. Uh, I think it's, it's more safe when we are in the desert proper and when we find the rock art and, 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 and isolated archaeological sites then in such situations, we can more safely uh, assume that they are somehow chronologically uh, connected. But in Dakhla, we have this huge palimpsest and um, this contextual data may be very, very tricky. So once again, I would like to emphasize that we have different traditions, sometimes overlapping, sometimes, uh, sometimes synchronous. So, um, so it's a very, uh, the whole corpus of, of uh, rock art in Dakhla is very diversified, both in terms of chronology and in terms of subject matter. Um, but the chart which I just showed is, is uh, let's say, um, the current state of research. But when the DOP um, began its survey in late 1970s and finished it sometime, I think, around mid-1980s, uh, not much was known about rock art at that time. Um, and DOP was registering all possible archaeological sites. They discovered hundreds of different sites from Paleolithic to, to Islamic period. 
Uh, but for some reason, not many rock art sites were really plotted on, on the maps. And uh, if we look at the map of this central and eastern part of Dakhla uh, from mid 80s, we see that just a couple of rock art sites are, are here um, marked. Uh, and for instance, all this uh, area of the sandstone ridge separating big, two big cultivation basins is basically empty. There's nothing there, not even uh, one rock art site. But um, in 2011, when I, when I joined the PetroGliv unit team, um, my colleagues were already working in, this, in the central Dakhla uh, for a couple of years. And um, they were able to discover and, and, and record uh, around uh, six, 70 uh, rock art sites, uh, which you can see here on in this map, in this uh, long valley uh, called by them uh, the Painted Wadi. Uh, so 70 sites, it's really a lot. Uh, some of these sites have uh, hundreds of petroglyphs. Um, some of these petroglyphs are really uh, extraordinary. So, so th this Painted Wadi, um, proved to be uh, a very rich area uh, in rock art. But when I, when I joined the team um, and, and worked in the Painted Wadi, I had um, new questions, let's say, uh, came to my mind. And one of these questions was, uh, how, how really unique is, is Painted Wadi in this area? How much is it uh, the state of research, a matter of state of research? And uh, how much is it really that painted wadi is a kind of a corridor uh, full of rock art and, 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 and it's something different than, uh, than the rest of these territories. I was actually, uh, well, we knew already that there are some uh, isolated rock art sites to the west of it, but, uh, but they were not uh, recorded and uh, not much of this, of this territory was actually surveyed before. So, so one of the first tasks uh, in terms of field work uh, I had was to, was to um, check this area for potential, uh, for all the potential rock art sites and, and to answer the question uh, whether painted wadi is really something unique or it's just a part of something bigger. And the question was answered quite, quite quickly and, and I think quite, um, uh, uh, the answer was quite obvious. Uh, there was there were mu there was much more rock art in the area uh, uh, because in this area that we were able to survey um, before the survey was stopped, uh, we could we could uh, add something about two hundred new rock art sites with um, more than thirteen hundred um, panels with rock art and rock inscriptions. So all these yellow dots. Uh, on this map are actually rock art panels. So, so um, we see that that basically all the whole of this uh, Samson Ridge is covered with rock art. Of course, there are certain clusters uh, and certain areas where rock art is more sparse. But uh, but in general, uh, the area is extremely abundant uh, in rock art, extremely rich in rock art. Um, just to, uh, let's say, to complete this picture of, of rock art distribution, the state of research, you can see again this, um, this central desert, central, sorry, central oasis area surveyed uh, by myself, and I will focus on this area um, in this presentation, but uh, it should be mentioned that a large uh, concentration of rock art, especially prehistoric rock art, was found uh, uh, already in 1930s and later in 1980s and 90s uh, in the southeastern corner of the uh, of the oasis, and and uh, well, it, it's it's comparable to what we have in the central oasis in terms of quantity of rock art and some other isolated um, uh, rock art sites uh, all over the oasis. But as I said, there is still a lot of areas to be to be properly surveyed. Um, yeah, so I would like to now 
offer you uh, a small window uh, to this uh, realm of, of rock art in Dakhla. Inevitably, uh, by necessity, uh, it will be it will be a very brief uh, overview, but uh, but hopefully uh, will spark some some interest. Um, first of all, when I arrived in Dakhla, one of the one of the first impressions impressions when when I when I visited the site uh, was that it has a very peculiar nature that the rock art locations there have of, have often very very particular character. Uh, we deal with places where where we have rock art from different periods accumulated, uh, often uh, superimposing each other. Uh, so we are dealing with places, small palimpses, uh, uh, with very heterogeneous um, assemblages. And uh, immediately there are two, uh, two implications of, of, of this situation. One is that um, on the one hand, it, it offers very interesting interpretative uh, avenues because one can ask questions. Uh, why is it that, uh, that, that, that people were adding new, new um, uh, petroglyphs to, to the older ones? Uh, was it was it on purpose? What was what was the intention, and so on? So it opens up certain certain questions. But on the other hand, from more I would say a practical point of view, um, it hampers the study a little bit because uh, we do not we often do not have a clear picture um, uh, because the petroglyphs are overlaying each other. Um, uh, or are among hundreds of other pictures. We have a lot of problems uh, with this basic, let's say, fundamental uh, stage of research, which is which is basically identification of particular particular uh, motifs. Identification meaning um, trying to to say what is depicted and how we can date it. Um, this is fundamental for any rock art research, and in Dakhla, in the Western Desert, it's always a very difficult uh, stage. And without, uh, let's say, um, proper identification, um, our efforts into interpretation, further interpretations, are of course uh, more difficult. But dating is, of course, a problem. This is something which uh, most of rock art researchers all over the world would say. But I would, but I would add that here in, in the Western Desert, it is particularly uh, difficult. And often, uh, all we can do is to ascribe certain petroglyphs into one of the three major, major categories, prehistoric rock art, dynastic rock art, and post-dynastic rock art. And I'm fully aware that in other Egyptological studies, such a, su such a dating of, of, uh, of subject matter would be, would be de uh, definitely insufficient. But in rock art studies, we sometimes have to, um, we have to uh, uh, be satisfied with this level of identification. Of course, there are situations and when, when we are able to, to, to date uh, petroglyphs uh, more precisely, um, especially when, when dealing with dynastic rock art, um, because with this historical rock art in general, um, we have more um, possibilities or better possibilities uh, in comparative work. So we can try to compare um, various motifs with motifs from other media, uh, from uh, official iconography from the Nile Valley, for instance, uh, and, and so on. It's uh, the more difficult situations with, the, with, with prehistoric uh, uh, rock art, uh, which uh, do not uh, have uh, too much analogies in the region and elsewhere. And, and we have to rely more on the contextual data than, than on comparative uh, analysis. Um, I shall probably also add that that there is a certain bias towards uh, towards prehistoric uh, rock art um, in Dakhla, in the Western Desert, and probably in the whole of Egypt. Uh, I mean, more studies 
have been offered to prehistoric uh, petroglyphs or paintings than to uh, uh, rock art from historical periods, including dynastic petroglyphs. This is for sure the situation in Dakhla. Even uh, in, in the last couple of years, uh, our expedition probably published more uh, material and more in, interpretations concerning, concerning um, prehistoric uh, petroglyphs. Uh, but this is a trend which I'm trying to, uh, to reverse in a way. And uh, more and more, um, more and more studies uh, are undertaken in, in the categories of especially dynastic rock art. The post dynastic being still uh, the most, um, let's say, neglect, neglected, uh, uh, unfortunately. Um, and this presentation, the rest of this presentation, also will focus more on the dynastic uh, depictions. Uh, uh, I will only um, briefly uh, characterize a couple of topics raised by us. Uh, uh, concerning prehistoric images, and then I will move uh, to, to dynastic, where I will provide a little bit more uh, detail. Also concerning the most up-to-date research, the ongoing research, uh, say, uh, saying also what, is, um, what are the obstacles uh, concerning this research. Um, so the first broad category of prehistoric uh, rock art consists mostly of zoomorphic imagery, and this is nothing really uh, unique. Uh, this is uh, something which we observe in the whole of the Western Desert, basically in the whole of uh, also also in the Eastern Desert of Egypt, also in Nubia, and actually in most of the Sahara. Um, when dealing with with prehistoric rock art, we are mostly dealing with animals, uh, and various studies in in recent years uh, were uh, undertaking. Uh, 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 the topic of animals, uh, for instance, uh, this fundamental identification of the species, for instance, uh, not only of, uh, of prehistoric images, but also of historic, historical images, but, uh, um, but not only that identification of the species and, and com comparing the species to archaeozoological uh, data available for Dakhla, but also um, there were inquiries into uh, um, certain diversity in, in stylistic, uh, into st stylistic variability of, of, these, of these images, because we clearly see that there are certain uh, groups of animals uh, uh, executed in, 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 in different styles and one can, one, can, um, one can pose a question whether it's an index of, of uh, it's a chronological index or maybe, maybe there is some other reason for, for uh, having uh, different, different ways of executing uh, these wild animals such as, as giraffes or oryx antelopes. Um, there was also a study uh, concerning um, visual modes uh, uh, and the ways uh, how movement uh, could have been depicted uh, in this prehistoric uh, rock art. Um, and uh, uh, studies into very abstract group of depictions known from Dakhla and elsewhere, often called abstract. Uh, geometric or, or, or curvy linear uh, group of, of petroglyphs like meandering lies, lines, um, uh, spirals, uh, concentric circles, and so on. Um, if animal depictions pose a lot of problems in terms of dating and interpretation, then this so-called abstract um, rock art is even harder to, 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 to interpret. And, uh, Often it is considered the, the oldest horizon of rock art production uh, in the Western desert. And it's possible, but probably some of these depictions also uh, should be uh, considered uh, uh, rather, I mean, younger, younger than, than uh, early to meet Holocene. And of course, uh, most of our studies in recent years uh, concern the most remarkable motif found in Dakhla and its environs. Uh, it's a motif of an anthropomorphic figure, often called um, a pregnant woman. Uh, this is a motif 
known already since 1930s and, and discussed by various scholars uh, in, in, uh, ever since. Um, a controversial motif, uh, which sparked at some points, sparked uh, a discussion uh, whether it really uh, depicts females or not. I won't go here now into uh, any details, but uh, um, some of our uh, interpretative uh, ideas uh, were published uh, in recent years and a new larger study is currently in preparation, a study which finally uh, summarize will summarize uh, the current state of our of our research on, uh, on this topic, um, providing also the, the most current numbers of the figures, which we know of about two hundred uh, depictions uh, from the entire Dakhla oasis, and uh, a, a certain new um, interpretative model will also be uh, presented. So. If anyone would like to um, know more about this uh, trademark motif of Dachlaoasis rock art, uh, then uh, I encourage uh, that person to, to, to follow us. Um, I think this, this motif is, is so remarkable and so uh, it, it's so unique, um, it's so indigenous uh, in Dakhla that, that we decided recently to, to use it, to, to put it into our logo. It's really um, something uh, extremely interesting and, uh, well, much more research, of course, is needed to, 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 to understand it more, uh, more better, oh, better, so that, that's the word. Okay, um, but this is a prehistoric rock art in a very, um, uh, presented in a very quick way, I would like to focus more on dynastic rock art, which, which was uh, always a bit neglected in Dakhla. And it's a pity because, because uh, we have a lot of uh, material of that kind. And uh, I think dynastic rock art offers something um, that more official iconography known from Egypt doesn't offer. Um, because it, this is this kind of rock art is, was probably produced by people um, not necessarily belonging to elite, uh, Egyptian elite, to higher status, to higher classes. Uh, we rather deal with uh, imagery created by people, um, you could call them ordinary people. Of course, they, they had to be competent enough to know certain, uh, certain uh, iconographic motifs. Uh, sometimes even they could have some rudim rudimentary uh, knowledge of uh, hieroglyphic uh, uh, writing. Um, so they had to be familiarized with, with this official iconography. But when we find most of this dynastic rock art in Dakhla, we always see that, that even though it immediately um, can be recognized as dynastic, as pharaonic, um, it's, from the formal point of view, rather clumsy, imperfect, uh, evident, I mean, uh, qu quite, quite obviously created by, by someone who wasn't uh, skilled enough in, in the art of uh, sculpture, for instance, or, or it wasn't a scribe and so on. Um, and it gives us a lot of information about, I think so at least, uh, about um, certain practices of those people traveling uh, through these desert areas uh, around Dakhla and, 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 and further. Um, we do find different classes of petroglyphs belonging to this dynastic period uh, from the most obvious hieroglyphic signs, isolated hieroglyphic signs, so, so not inscriptions, but rather um, hieroglyphic signs acting as, as some sort of symbols or um, yeah, or signs, um, to anthropomorphic figures, again, um, executed in such a style that even a layman will immediately recognize it as something, as something um, dynastic, but uh, far from the, uh, the skillful execution of formal iconography. Uh, although sometimes it happens that we really can find quite good parallels in this more uh, 
uh, formal uh, media. Uh, here is such an example. Um, we have a very eroded and, and faint um, procession of human figures found on one of the sites in the central oasis. Um, these are anthropomorphs holding staves um, and direct oriented to the right and, and very similar and from the stylistic point of view and also from the point of view of subject matter uh, procession of people on, on, on a stela from Amheda dated to the first intermediate period. And, and this is where we're starting dynastic roll cut can be really um, rewarding because uh, we really can uh, look for some comparative material uh, and, and, and try to date uh, some of the finding, findings uh, a little bit more uh, precise. There are many other different categories. I won't, uh, I won't uh, show all of them here, just, uh, just a couple. Uh, like boats, which of course are one of these motifs that uh, dynastic rock art usually features. Uh, we know it from Nubia, we know it from Eastern Desert and the Nile Valley, and we also have it in Dakhla, even though uh, no standing water, no rivers and so on uh, were present in the times of dynastic uh, occupation of Dakhla. But we do find different kinds of vessels. And again, if those vessels are uh, have a certain level of detail uh, depicted, then we can try to look for some comparanda. And, 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 and uh, for some of these um, vessels, uh, I was able to, to, to find um, analogies that help us date those, those depictions to old to new kingdom times, uh, sometimes even more precisely uh, to, for instance, Middle Kingdom 12th dynasty. Uh, or at least close to that uh, point in time. So um, this reversing of the trend of neglecting dynasty rock art is something which is still ongoing. Um, a couple of different studies uh, shall be available quite soon. I mean, they should be published quite soon. They are forthcoming. Uh, anyone who would be interested in, in a certain um, overview of dynastic repertoire uh, uh, will have such a ch chance when, when um, uh, the book uh, by Chloe Ragazzoli and, and, and Kiera Salvador and uh, uh, Hassan will, will be published. And uh, another uh, study concerning just one motif, one particular but very unique motif of an alleged female dancer uh, will be published in a Polish uh, archaeology in the Mediterranean this this year, I hope. So so I'm uh, encouraging to to check this, um, and I hope that with this publication, the dynastic rock art from Dakhla uh, will spark more interest into this category of rock art. Um, now coming back to our um, central oasis area, um, when the fieldwork was finished, uh, fieldwork uh, uh, related to the previous um, uh, 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 grant project. Uh, we were, we, we received, let's say, a, a quite a big picture uh, because a, a, a large, well-defined area was surveyed for rock art and certain, certain distributional patterns started to emerge, but also um, during the survey, um, I was able to record other um, archaeological remains, including uh, large quantities, uh, well, spots with large quantities of pottery uh, or road signs made of stones and, and all the features uh, which uh, suggested the existence of at least two paths or routes crossing the sandstone uh, reach in the past. In the past, meaning that these um, routes could have been in existence already during Old Kingdom times, uh, and they were surely the, the, the usage was was continu continued in, in 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 later period, and actually even in modern in modern times. 
because we uh, still see the trolling paths uh, in, in this area and they are still being in use by some people. Um, but that was, let's say, a hypothesis that we are dealing with with these roots. Uh, it, 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 it seems to me that, that these roots are very much connected with particular kinds of rock art, uh, that, there's, that there is rock art which, uh, which is particularly connected to these roots, but that, that was meant to be just the basis for another project that would uh, definitely extend this research, uh, both from the theoretical point of view, but also from the point of view of, of collected data and, and, ex, uh, and, and by extending uh, fieldwork. So um, the aim was to, um, was to better, was a better mapping of certain features like this uh, road signs, uh, like the uh, pottery concentrations, um, the collect collecting of this pottery and, and, and dating it was one of the most important uh, uh, tasks uh, before the project. Um, but the life is cruel. And despite having these um, uh, the finances to, 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 to carry out this research, uh, our mission, like any other uh, foreign mission uh, working in this area, uh, has been stopped. And it's already it's already um, seven years, if not more, that that uh, that uh, no fieldwork is possible in in the area. So the project was uh, well. That was a it was a hard hit for us because without this additional, more precise data, um, it's difficult to realize the, the aims of the project. Still, though. Um, the project is ongoing and uh, despite not having fieldwork, uh, we can at least uh, analyze uh, the material that was collected in previous seasons and, and also the, the archival material uh, from 1980s, for instance, and uh, employ more um, theoretical concepts, uh, simply working with what we, what we have at hand. Um, and what is what is the core of this project of this of this study is that is is the relationship of of rock art and movement and this movement of course can be defined in in many ways can be approached from different theoretical angles but uh, um, let's say an overarching idea is that uh, of course we we today find rock art in places which are uh, which seem to be quite static. The rock art is fixed in place and so on. And not, not much is happening around uh, most of the sites. But in the past, in antiquity, in, uh, in, in dynastic period, for instance, um, this landscape of Dakhla must have been, I assume, uh, very active, very dynamic and full of movement of uh, mostly of people, of course. So we have to realize that a lot of movement was was uh, connected with um, um, long distance travel. People were traveling to and from the oasis from different areas, uh, uh, especially from the Nile Valley, but, but also from other oasis. Uh, and perhaps even more uh, movement was was uh, conducted in this micro scale. I mean, people had to travel from settlement to settlement for various reasons. And uh, as we can see, because uh, major settlements and many uh, minor settlements were located in these two big cultivation basins, we can expect, we can assume that at least some traffic uh, must have uh, occurred in this area of our, of our rock art concentration. So people uh, most probably traveled through that, through that area. And uh, finally, there was, a lot of traffic caused by military or paramilitary uh, troops um, that policing the desert, uh, controlling the uh, various uh, official and, and, and unofficial routes. And we have a lot of evidence for that, uh, for that system of, of uh, controlling um, 
all around Dakhla, uh, more than two dozen um, watch post sites, hilltop sites uh, were discovered, some of them excavated. And what is important from the point of view of rock art research is that these sites also uh, produced a lot of rock art, sometimes rock art very explicitly uh, soldierly in character as this quite famous depiction of a soldier with a lotus flower and his equipment found on a slab stone uh, in one of the watch posts um, called Neftis Hill. So um, in this very dynamic landscape full of movement, rock art uh, I think should be interpreted as part of this movement in a way. And of course, again, as I said, there are many different theoretical angles here available. And, and uh, one can think of this rock art and movement relationships in different ways. Uh, I think the most basic way of, of connecting rock art and movement is to think about rock art as, as a kind of index of people, people's movement. So in other words, um, uh, rock art tells us that some, someone was there. Uh, it's of course an obvious, obvious uh, implication. But when we have more data like this, we can, um, we can also say more about uh, certain places and certain, in this case, uh, routes and their nature and character. Um, so I would just give you a couple of examples uh, uh, of possible relationship of rock art and movement, there are different categories of motifs, such as uh, these three and two legged signs, which are probably kind of identity marks dated to late Old Kingdom and also uh, a bit later times. And when we check what is their distribution, uh, this, the pattern of the distribution, we see that, that this kind of motif is found only in the areas which which are um, corresponding to our hypothesized uh, roots. So it tells us something um, both about the roots and about this particular motif. It may mean that that creating of these petroglyphs was somehow um, functionally or meaningfully uh, connected with the roots uh, themselves. Uh, and another type of so-called identity marks, at least these kind of, uh, these kinds of, of depictions are uh, often interpreted as such, as such marks. Uh, and when we check their distribution in the central oasis, we see that again, uh, they quite uh, uh, clearly fit the, uh, the tra tra trajectory of, uh, of, the, of the roots. So um, again, uh, these identity marks, uh, if they are uh, where identity marks, um, they find parallels uh, in the region and some of them can be quite well dated to, to the late kingdom, but also examples, uh, uh, later examples, uh, middle to, to new kingdom uh, are also uh, possible. Uh, or another example of the anthropomorphic figures, um, their distribution, of course, we're dealing here with only a handful of, of depictions, but, but again, we see that, that most of them are found uh, where the roots are uh, pre present, especially the northern route, and uh, plays well with this linear distribution of anthropomorphic figures. So again, it seems like uh, all those depictions were created uh, in the process of traveling through that, through that area. Or yet another example uh, of a pubic triangle. Um, it's, it's actually an ongoing study, but I can, I can show you, for instance, um, one particular type of pubic triangle, probably of dynastic origin, maybe even Old Kingdom. Uh, it's the most common uh, type of these of these pubic triangles, and again, its distribution is quite clear. It's it it can be found basically only where the roots uh, are hypothesized to exist. So again, there is some connection uh, of the practice of creating those petroglyphs with the very act of moving through this through this landscape. Um, 
And a final example of this of this issue, uh, uh, the very religious, um, very religious uh, uh, iconography. Uh, in this case, it's uh, the iconography showing this, the animal of God Seth, the, the, the most important god of Dakla Oasis for a long time. Uh, we don't have many of such depictions uh, in the central oasis. We know uh, about we, we know. I think it's around 18 depictions so far uh, discovered, but all of them are are clustered, and most of them clustered in the area where the southern route uh, is present. So again, a motif that was created on the move and and perhaps um, linked to a particular practice. Uh, in this case, uh, possibly uh, religious in nature. Um, we can even try, although it's it's controversial and, and very high, uh, and, and it's, it's just a hypothesis. Uh, but it can, we can try at least at least to think about recognizing um, movements of particular people or particular groups of people. Um, a couple of examples, just just a couple of examples. Uh, I think that such situations are possible when we are dealing with very unique uh, motif or with a motif that is that is uh, executed in a very particular, uh, a unique style. Um, of course, uh, this cannot be proved beyond uh, doubt, but at least can be hypothesized. And one such example concerns one of such identity marks, uh, first discovered on Neftis Hill, uh, dated to Old Kingdom by Olaf Kapper. Is it's, 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 it was found on two stone slabs. Uh, and for a long time, didn't have any any analogy, either from Dakla or from the rest of Egypt. But uh, a couple of years ago, um, I was able to locate such a sign uh, in the central Dakla, and and now the question occurs: uh, if that if we assume that that's a, a really a unique identity mark of a person or a group of persons, then we uh, actually receive two indexes of, the, of, of a certain movement. Uh, we can say something more about trajectories of people's movement across the oasis. It's 25 kilometers uh, between these two places. And if we would have more of such data, we can perhaps um, arrive at a more detailed uh, network of movements across the oasis. And maybe we can say something more about uh, the system of movement uh, for instance, between various watch posts. That's, so that's one avenue, interpretational avenue uh, available here. An example of a, of a petroglyph that is unique in, in, in a style, in a manner of execution. So we have this, this depiction of an elephant found in Halfa del Bir, which is very north. It's, 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 it's north of the oasis, basically. And it's, this, it's 25 kilometers again, uh, this uh, apart from from uh, site CO193, where I was able to locate a very similar uh, depiction. Of course, again, there's no certainty that it's produced by the same hand, but I think that that is at least a possibility, if not probability, that that's the case. So again, we are dealing with two indexes of, of human presence, and, and and we know something more about uh, people's movements across. The oasis, which are quite, uh, I mean, this, this, this distances are quite, quite considerable. Or uh, the third example, maybe the less convincing, but but showing that at least certain ideas uh, were, were traveling across the oasis. We 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 have here uh, depictions of the set animal uh, sniffing a lotus flower, something very very unique. Uh, I don't know of of such examples from outside outside of uh, Western Desert. And very similar, but very faint depictions found again in the central Dakhla, where we have uh, set animals with lotus flowers. Stylistically, a bit different, but but the motive is is the same. So so we again have some kind of um, some kind of movement of a motif, at least, and not necessarily of the same person uh, execute, executing this this petroglyphs, but. Rock art considered as an index of movement is just one way of understanding this relationship uh, of rock art and, and mobility and movement and motion. Uh, what is very interesting for me uh, is 
is a reverse situation, is to, is to ask about rock art as influencing, affecting people's movements. So rock art as something that, uh, that acts, that governs, that influences uh, people's choices, decisions, people's perception. Uh, so uh, simply, to put it simply, rock art as having certain agency, agency uh, 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 and capacity of affecting uh, those traveling people in this landscape. I know it from my own experience that, that uh, spotting rock art in such a landscape uh, and remaining different is very difficult. I mean, uh, rock art has this very strong power of attracting attention. So uh, uh, extrapolating this experience onto the past people, uh, one can assume that the people uh, um, were encountering rock art and this rock art was somehow guiding people through that landscape, uh, communicating different, different messages um, and, and, and also um, requiring other people to respond to that rock art. For instance, by, by creating and adding new depiction so you can imagine that that when you pass by such a such a rock especially for the first time uh it's really difficult to not to not to uh, uh, come closer and to to uh, to start to analyze and study uh, such depictions so so the last uh, uh, element of our studies which i would like to briefly show here uh, considers this rock art dialogue that that used to happen that still happen in this in this landscape uh, which shows which show us that that people uh, really um, sp spotted rock art in, 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 on their travels uh, and reacted to them uh, they reinterpreted uh, uh, older rock art by adding new uh, uh, depictions and somehow they could they were able to reuse extract some kind of power from from the older depictions in order to in order to uh, create something something new and to achieve a certain uh, certain goals um, for instance uh, uh, it was it was possible to to detect that uh, one of such motifs of the dynastic and post dynastic origin uh, motifs that it was frequently used to to refer to this older rock art uh, is the motif of fruit and of and of a sandal. So we find really a considerable number of panels where we have feet and sandals either superimposed on the older depictions or just super uh, or just juxtaposed or just placed nearby, but somehow spatially referring to these older depictions. What those people um, thought about the older rock art is, of course, a matter of, of interpretation, and, and we can only guess. Uh, but I believe we have this material evidence that, that, that the older rock art was somehow uh, reused, reconceptualized in order to achieve other goals, possibly, or possibly uh, uh, th that could be related to some. Uh, uh, religious practices, communications with the deities, and 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 so on. And this is and this is of course uh, that topic was was heavily explored by myself and in re in, in various uh, publications and including my my PhD, which is uh, unfortunately available only in Polish. But um, but that was one of the driving questions uh, during those last ten years uh, because I find it extremely interesting. To, to, to have this interaction of rock art with other rock arts. So of course that not only not only feet and sandals, other 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 uh, motifs also can play this role like this frequently shown by me, a panel where this set animal is actually placed onto the onto the uh, uh, prehistoric giraffes uh, like a stamp and and uh, one can, expect that that was really a meaningful addition um, extracting some kind of significance from the prehistoric images. Um, 
as I said, um, the feet and sandals are, uh, are often used in that way. And in general, uh, feet and sandals are one of the most uh, abundant uh, motifs in the entire oasis. Only in the central Dakla, we, we know of more than 1,000 petroglyphs of that kind. Uh, they are definitely not all, not all of them are of the same chronology. Uh, they, they probably have a long chronology from Old Kingdom uh, to post-dynastic times, to the Greco-Roman period at least. Um, and the meanings related to, with them, of course, also might be, might be var uh, variable, but, uh, but uh, many of them were used as some kind of tools to interact with other, other rock art. Um, Yes, and the, the last thing uh, which is basically connected to that is, uh, is my own interest and, and some of my current studies uh, uh, revolve around this notion, is this um, trying to, to better understand the relationship of pharaonic Egyptians uh, colonizing Dakhla and also in later period and their interaction with what can be called uh, the indigenous landscape of Dakhla. So, uh, of course, in this case, it, it, it concerns mostly rock art. And my studies are trying to understand those relationships, not so much as an appropriation of this landscape by, by uh, Egyptians. So it's not so much about um, um, socializing this blank landscape, um, uh, by Egyptians, but rather uh, emphasizing that this indigenous landscape in its various forms, as in this case, in, in the form of rock art, was always in, in some kind of interplay with, with Egyptians and was forcing Egyptians in a way to respond with their own uh, rock art. So we are dealing with this kind of circular mutual relationship uh, within which certain significance and meanings of, of rock art uh, uh, would emerge. So um, that is, that is uh, basically all I wanted to share with, with you today. I know that uh, um, all this, that there's many, there are many topics and, and every, each of these topics uh, was just very briefly sketched. Um, but as I said, I, was, I wanted this this presentation to be more of a guide uh, to what is going on in Dakhla, even despite uh, the lack of fieldwork in recent years, and that, that this is a very diversified research, uh, trying to grasp different aspects, uh, also employing different theoretical uh, stances, and that there is a, a, quite a lot of um, publications already available and new ones uh, hopefully will arrive soon and that uh, if anyone uh, uh, would be interested in this research and would like to have more information this is available and and the best is to contact myself directly and i will i will help as much as i can so thank you very much